Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk to you on the subject of prayer, but before we get there, can we do something? Can we all just close our eyes? Close your eyes, please. Let's take a deep breath. And for a moment, this might, might not apply to all of us. But would you, if you see yourself this morning, you feel like you're in control of your life, that you are the center of your life, could we remove ourselves? Could we remove ourselves as the center of our own universe and place God in the center? That's the only way this message is going to sit well with us if we remove ourselves from the center of our own universe. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that allowed us to get here safely, God, and for keeping us this week. Lord, this morning as we prepare to, to hear your word, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would teach us something new. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. So as you guys know, I'm the, uh, I'm the youth director here as well as the associate pastor, and one of the things we get to do is break up into small groups with our, our teens, and generally, at the end of our small group, what we'll do is we'll take prayer requests. It's kind of funny. It's not funny, but it is funny at the same time hearing some of the prayer requests because a lot of them tend to sound the same. It's not to knock or minimize any prayer request, but they do all kind of sound the same after a while. Maybe it's because in the back of everyone's Bible we have one of these. Could you show that slide, Saya? It's the generic prayer request generator. My obscure relative, uh, their acquaintance is, you can fill in the blank there. How about this one for a suggested daily prayer? Lord, so far today I'm doing okay. I haven't gossiped, I haven't lied, I haven't lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or self-indulgent. I haven't whined, I haven't cursed, I haven't eaten any chocolate. But, but, in just a few minutes I'm about to get up out of bed. I'm definitely going to need more help after that. <laughs> this morning, we're going to take a, a quick look at a video uh, that I found on what prayer is. What is prayer? In many ways, prayer is a simple thing to do. But sometimes we can have a limited view of what prayer actually is. Now, don't get me wrong. Prayer is a means of supplication and making requests to God. It's just that... Prayer is also more than that. Prayer is both talking to God and having a relationship with Him. Prayer is making yourself available to God and allowing Him to make Himself available to you. Prayer is a way to ask God for provision for tomorrow and a means by which He provides the sustenance we need for today. So we pray not to get our own way, but rather we pray to align ourselves to God's will. We pray not for things that might create independence from God, but rather we pray as an expression of dependence upon God. Yes, God loves to hear our prayers and requests. He listens to them, He delights in them, and He responds to them. It's just that prayer is also where we can confess our sins, praise His goodness, listen to His voice, and be reminded of truth. Prayer isn't just a way to ask for more fruit, but through prayer, we begin to bear more fruit. Prayer isn't just words spoken at specific times during the day. It's living with a mindset that allows God to transform you throughout all of your days. So don't think of prayer as just an activity done before meals or bedtime, but rather think of prayer as a way of life. It's a pretty powerful video that tells us what prayer really is. Prayer is surrender. It's surrender uh, to the will of God in cooperation with his will. I like the way E. Stanley Jones puts it. He says, if I throw out a boat hook from the boat and catch hold of the shore, do I pull the shore to me? Or do I pull myself to the shore? Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but the aligning of my will to the will of God. So why, why is this subject important to me? Let me tell you, over the past couple weeks, um, Larry showed this a couple weeks ago, and I haven't said anything to him, but over the past couple weeks, God has laid uh, prayer on, on Pilar and I's heart. Um, every night we spend at least a few minutes praying for some of our needs, and, and then God will lay somebody on our heart from either the church body or somebody in our family, and we'll just pray for them for a little while. How about the idea of an early uh, Sunday service um, 
prayer group. So just before service, God has laid this on my heart also. Just, just before service, we'll gather together as many of us as, as would like. And we'll just lift up today's services or uh, some of the needs of our body. What about parents encouraging parents? Something God laid in my heart last year that we'll be uh, throwing back into play this, this uh, coming fall. It's an opportunity for parents to gather together and receive encouragement from each other and to pray for their children. This morning, I want to challenge us a little bit to move beyond prayer requests. What I don't have and what I can't guarantee you is a secret formula to have our prayers answered. I don't have any special keys to unlocking God's power and provision. What I do know is that prayer matters. It makes a difference. And that in some inexplicable way, prayer changes outcomes and it shapes destinies. Through prayer, I know that we partner with God in fulfilling his eternal purposes. That's why Jesus told us to always pray and not to lose heart. You see, Jesus spent how many years teaching? He spent three years teaching. He spent the last 2,000 years interceding. Scriptures also command us to pay, pray. I love what 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says. It says, the first thing I want you to do is pray. The first thing I want you to do is pray. Pray every way you know how for everyone you know. This is the way our Savior God wants us to live. So prayer is important. If it's important to God, it's important to us, or it should be important to us. The thing is, I think a lot of times we get mixed up with the busyness of life, and we often kind of throw that to the wayside and say, you know what, I don't need it right now, so why bother? Keep in mind the following things as we talk about prayer. First, the fact that God hears us. Acts 27, verses 7, or 17, verses 27 to 28. He is actually not far from each, of, each one of us. For in him we live and we move and we have our being. We are indeed his offspring. He's right there next to us. He hears us when we call on him. What about the fact that prayer enhances our relationship with God? It brings us closer in relationship with him when we talk with him. Jeremiah 32, 33 verses 2 and 3 says, Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it to establish it. He says, Call to me and I will answer you. And I will tell you great and hidden things that you have yet to know. And what about the fact that our prayers and God's answers give us joy and peace in our hearts? Can you guys repeat something after me? In everything, pray. If I were to give this sermon a subtitle, that would be it. Simple enough, right? In everything, pray. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And I love this part of the scripture. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. A lot of times we'll be praying for someone, or I'll be praying for someone, who might be going through some sort of a storm. Anybody here ever been through a storm of some sort? Yeah, uh, so have I. <laughs> and I'll say, Lord, please just let the peace your peace beyond all understanding reign in their lives. And that peace is not a peace because we've received our answer or been taken out of the storm, but it's a peace in spite of knowing all the answers. He grants us his peace before we have all the answers. You see, our challenges, the things we go through, might not necessarily disappear or become easier, but in prayer we tend to gain this new perspective and along with that new perspective, we get this peace and this patience to be able to stand firm in the midst of our challenges. So speaking of a new perspective, there was a guy in uh, the African desert. He was being pursued by this roaring, hungry lion. He's running, and he feels this lion's breath on his neck. And knowing his time is short, he cried out to God, Lord, Lord, please make this lion a Christian. So he keeps running, and finally he realizes the lion is no longer behind him. He looks behind, and, and he sees the lion a long way off, and the lion is on his knees in obvious prayer. So he said to himself, you know what, the lion's a Christian. I'm going to go join this lion in prayer and meditation. As he comes close, as he's approaching the lion, he hears the lion say, and bless, O oh Lord, this meal for which I'm exceedingly grateful. Talk about a change of perspective. 
I don't know what that story had to do with my message, but I got to tell you, I read it and I was cracking up in my office. So I was like, I got to share this. Back to what we were saying, our challenges might not disappear. But when we pray, we gain a new perspective on those challenges. We gain a new perspective on those challenges and our problems. And we get this peace and this patience to be able to stand firm in the midst of those storms we face. Mother Teresa said this. She said, love to pray. Feel often during the day the need for prayer. And take trouble to pray. Prayer enlarges the heart until it is capable of containing God's gift of himself. Ask and seek and your heart will grow big enough to receive him. James chapter 5, a couple of background facts on James chapter 5. We're going to talk about the, seven part, the second part, starting at verse 7. James chapter 5, verses 7 to 12. Basically, James, what he's trying to do is give his readers, listeners, a couple of resources uh, to, to use in, in waiting for the Lord's return. And the first one he goes through is patience. James reminds Christians that, uh, like Job, they can rest in the insurance of God's rescue when they're going through struggles. And then in verses 13 to 18, he, he emphasizes prayer, which is what we're going to talk about. He insisted that we don't underestimate the power of prayer. Prayer has the power to change things. He says uh, the prayers of those who trust in God are, are powerful and effective. So why don't we read this scripture in James chapter 5, verses 13 to 18. It says this, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the same name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed a sin, he will be forgiven. Therefore, verse 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person has great power as it is working. The prayer of the righteous person has great power as it is working. For Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three and a half years it, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. A couple observations on this little paragraph, verses 13 to 18. It's pretty obvious that James emphasizes, emphasizes in this passage the importance of prayer. He repeats the word prayer seven times. When you're sick, you pray. When you're going through storms, when you're suffering, pray. If you've sinned, pray. The prayer of the righteous person. And he talks about Elijah. He prayed fervently and then he prayed again. Interesting to note, he throws in there, is anyone cheerful? I asked before if anybody's experienced storms. Has anybody experienced good times? Yeah, right? We've all experienced those good times. Here's my encouragement to you, and this isn't really part of my message, just a little side note. Don't forget God when things are going well. You see, I think our tendency is when things are going badly, we, we run to God. Oh, God, where are you? I need your help. But then when things are going good and we're cheerful and we're happy, we tend to forget about God. When our hearts feel comforted, it's easy to forget about all that God has done for us. The truth is we should seek to acknowledge God's goodness, his supreme role in our lives, especially when he's blessed us and made us cheerful. So what does the word righteous mean? The prayers of the righteous person are power, powerful and effective in its working. Righteousness simply means to be wholeheartedly committed to, to Christ and devoted to seeking to do his will. It means you give your life to Christ who gave his all to you. It means my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We can begin to live in this way, this, this way of righteousness, in a way that pleases God and fulfills his purposes for us. We can do that because he gives us that ability. See, rather than trying to prove ourselves good enough for, for him or to live up to these impossible moral standards, we can relate to him in love, expecting him to help us make the choices we ought to make. There's a difference. There's a big difference between 
uh, being involved and being committed. I, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard this before. If this is the first time I heard it. It's kind of like a bacon or a ham and egg breakfast, right? You have the egg. The chicken was involved. He gave the egg. But then you have the pig, who did more than just give an egg. He gave himself. That's what being committed is. Psalm, Psalms chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call him. The prayers of the righteous are heard. Psalm 34, 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the, right, on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cries. So that scripture, the prayer of the righteous, the prayers of those who are devoted, committed, sincerely and genuinely to seeking to do God's will. Those prayers have great working. Our prayers have great working. There's a couple of insights I want to give you that when I read this scripture, I feel like God brought me to. Now, you have to forgive me. Uh, a few months back, Pastor Ed said something pretty funny. He said he has the ability to take a sermon and turn it into a series and a series into a saga. Well, my tendency is to do quite the opposite, okay? I can take a saga and squeeze it into a sermon, so forgive me for that. Um, okay. All right. So the first insight I gained from reading the scripture is that when we're sick, when we're facing challenges, when we need forgiveness in the mundane, what's that, what's that telling me that's telling me that at all times we ought to pray? At all times. What does it mean to pray at all times? I know growing up in, in church and youth ministry and youth groups and whatnot, I used to hear a whole lot of different responses as to what it meant to pray at all times. Like, you literally pray at all times, that you're always praying at all times. But I don't think it meant that. James says when we're sick, when we're facing challenges, when we're going through those storms, we pray. We need forgiveness, we pray. Pray at all times. Acts chapter 10, verse 1. It tells us that Cornelius, a guy named Cornelius, he prayed continued, continually to God. Romans chapter 12, 12. Chapter 12, verse 12, be constant in prayer. Paul says in Colossians chapter, two, chapter 4, verse 2, continue steadfastly in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. And Paul again, Ephesians 6, 18, pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. You see, it's not, I don't believe it's the moving of the lips as much as it is the elevation of our hearts to God. You see, it's impossible for us to spend all day with words of prayer on our mouth. It's impossible. But it is possible for us to live all day in a spirit of, of prayer, realizing that we're dependent on God. For all we have and all we are, being conscious, being present to God's presence, which Larry shared last week, with us wherever we might be and yielding ourselves continuously to do his will. You see, praying at all times doesn't mean repeating formulas in this kind of vain and repetitious manner all throughout the day. It doesn't mean mumbling a certain formula. What it does mean is living with this sort of God consciousness. It's this thing where everything we see, everything we face, everything we experience is this uh, something we want to share with our best, or closest, most intimate friend. That's what praying at all times means. I like this quote I read. It says, since communication with God is to occur throughout the day, don't imagine that precludes the need for passion in our prayers. Paul commanded the Colossians, devote yourselves to prayer. Keep alert in it. And then he warned the Ephesians to be alert with all perseverance and petition as they prayed. Because in order to accomplish what God wants in our lives, it must be an all-consuming practice that makes alertness and perseverance its most valuable commodities. The first part is to pray at all times. And the second part kind of melds with the other one. It says pray fervently. Pray fervently. Now, Elijah uses the example of, uh, I'm sorry, James uses the example of Elijah. And he starts off with uh, this phrase, a man with a nature like ours. So he was just like us. He rebukes kings, stops the rain for three and a half years, calls down fire from heaven, 
He outruns chariots. He restores a dead boy back to life by laying on his body. He's fed by ravens. He provides food for a widow that is uh, supernaturally uh, self-replenishing. He's carried off to heaven in, chari in a chariot of fire. So he's just like us, right? Other than that, I think Elijah was very much a human being, just like us. And James refers to Elijah saying, a man with a nature like ours. I think what he's saying is, uh, someone just like us had a powerful prayer life. We could have a powerful prayer life. One thing Elijah did very well was the fact that he prayed fervently. He prayed, uh, the, the, the phrase prayed fervently is literally uh, translated into he prayed with prayer, he prayed intensely. Listen to what it says in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 41 to 46. It says, And Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. And he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And we, he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, go again, seven times, seven times. That's significant, seven times. He said, go again, seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black and with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. Elijah prayed seven times. I think a lot of times we bring a prayer request to the Lord and after two or three times we kind of forget about it and say, well, it is what it is. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things my father taught me um, growing up, and he's got a lot of these quirky sayings that kind of annoy me sometimes, but they, they teach me something. One of the things my father would say is, um, what's the worst they could say? No, right? He prayed... Uh, seven times. He didn't give up after two or three times. He didn't throw in the towel and say, God's not going to answer my prayers. He prayed with prayer. He prayed fervently. Elijah also prayed in the chapter before for the little boy who died. First Kings 17, 22. A little boy came back to life and it says the Lord heard Elijah's prayer. You see, some people think God really doesn't want to be bothered with our requests. But if we beg hard enough, if we beg, beg long enough, then maybe we can overcome God's reluctance. But I don't think that's the case. Because prayer isn't really overcoming the reluctance of an uncooperative God. Prayer is embracing the willingness of a heavenly Father who loves and desires to give us good gifts. Jesus said this, if you, being evil, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father Give good things to those who ask. James, a little earlier in his, in his writing, says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. God, just like any father, is willing, to des and willing and desirous of giving us good gifts, good things. Elijah prayed fervently. Somebody else who emulates this is Jacob. In Genesis chapter 32, uh, it says, and Jacob was left alone, verse 24, and and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip. And obviously Jacob is wrestling with God here. And Jacob's hip, hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Verse 26, then he said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Because I think sometimes we have to grab hold of God in prayer and not let go until he blesses us. Again, prayer is not overcoming the reluctance of an un uncooperative God, but it's laying hold. It's grabbing on to his highest willingness. The scriptures in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 say this, For whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. There's two things I gain from that scripture. Number one is that we serve an approachable God. And number one, or number two, is that he blesses those who diligently, fervently, intensely, who don't stop asking, who seek him. The secret of the constancy of grace and virtue lies in the perseverance of prayer. 
This thought challenged me as I was reading the scripture, and this is the last thought I'm going to bring to you today. It says, pray having faith, having faith in God's provision and his sovereign will. I spoke a while back, actually a couple years ago now, on the subject of having big faith in a big God. I think a lot of times what we do is we minimize God's power with our view of him. We say he's not capable of that, or he can't do that. How many of you know there's nothing too hard for the Lord? There's nothing too hard for God. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 36 to 38. It says this, And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came, came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. There's something to that. That has to do with the relationship he has with God. He's actually referring to, to Jacob. Jacob had his name changed to Israel. And he's referring to the relationship he has here with God. Let it be known that uh, this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Listen to this. He says, answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have, t you have turned their hearts back. Verse 38, God answers his prayer. It says, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Elijah, Elijah's prayer emulates great confidence and faith in God's power and provision. Hebrews 10, to 23 says this. It's an awesome scripture. Let us draw near with the true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Can I encourage you this morning? He who promised is faithful. I don't know who that word is for, but he who promised is faithful. A writer of Hebrews admonishes his readers to go before God with a true heart, one that's real, one that's honest, one that's sincere before God in full assurance of faith, understanding that there's no reason to doubt that we can go to God in prayer, the veil has been torn. We have access to God. We can go to him. Give her requests. Let us hold fast to the confession of hope. Be confident in God. Because he who promised is faithful. The significance of our prayers is not, not the words that we're saying. But the person to whom we're addressing. Remember that God delights in answering our prayers. Have faith in him while you're praying. Come in simplicity and trust like a father or like a child to a father. Martin Luther said this, where there is no faith and confidence in prayer, the prayer is dead. What I did was I jotted down some personal commitments that I personally have made um, in, in my prayer life. And I just want to share them with you and take, take with you what you want. And, um, the first one I wrote down was to be consistent to regard our prayer time as a daily appointment we've set with God and respect it. Set your heart to pursue the, the knowledge, the person of God, the ways of God by spending time with him. What about the idea of focusing on who God is? Prepare your heart by releasing all the stressors, the anxieties that you've accumulated and give them to God. Concentrate your attention on his present. Be present to God's presence in your life. Rest in his presence. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 tells us to cast all our anxiety on him because he cares for us. The third one is don't do all the talking. I know that's our tendency is to just talk and talk and talk. And we never sit still and listen to what God is saying to us. It's not weird to meditate before God. It really isn't. Practice times of silence before God so you can be sensitive to his promptings, the promptings of the spirit. How about this one? Come before him in humility. It was that thing I talked about earlier, removing ourselves from the center of our own universe and recognizing it's, it's God's anyway. Approach him in honesty and openness. Don't try to cover up. He already knows the mess we are. A couple things to remember. First one is to pray fervently. If necessary, pray twice. Pray three times. Pray four times. Or like Elijah, prayed seven times. 
What's the worst he can tell you? No. He knows best anyway, doesn't he? Pray fervently. Pray intensely. We have a perfect example in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. It says, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him. He did that for us. Pray at all times. Right? That was the first one. Life becomes this ascending prayer. We live with this sort of consciousness of God. All of its thoughts, all of its circumstances become a cause or a point of communication with God. It's something that you want to share with your closest, most intimate friend. That's what it means to set your affections on things above. That's what it means to think about Christ. Everything becomes a prayer. All of our thoughts, all of our experiences you share with your closest, most intimate friend. After all, that's the reason he saved you, for fellowship, to fellowship with him. Luke chapter 18, verse 1, tells us this, and he told them a parable, Jesus told them a parable, to the effect that they might always uh, pray and not lose heart. The last one is pray with faith in God's sovereign uh, and God's provision and his sovereign will. Remember that God delights in answering our prayers. And he's provided us with plenty of promises that should motivate us to talk with him. Understand that God gives different answers at different times according to his will. I'm going to close with this quote by, by Max Lucado, and we'll, we'll pray together. It says this, Faith is not belief that God will do what you ask or pray for. Faith is belief that God will do what is right. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time, this opportunity you give us to worship you, Lord. Father, we ask that what we've spoken about today, God, will continue to speak to us throughout the days to come, God, and that you would help us to grow in our prayer walk. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. In your name, amen.